Welcome back to Mad Presents. I'm here a little earlier than you expected me, but uh, I've decided I want to move movie nights from bi-weekly to weekly, at least until the virus is over. So we're going to do this this Friday too, and next Friday, and the Friday after that. And then we'll see where we are amongst all this. I also want to say... Massive spoilers for the movies I'm talking about this week. I said it in the first video, we're going to do spoilers in these discussions, but I really want to emphasize that today. Spoilers. So first off this week, we watched Run Lola Run. Uh, originally titled Lola Rint, which is... It just means Lola Runs. Or Run Lola. Could be either. A German action crime film... Um, I think I actually described the plot wrong in my, uh, Action Movie World Tour. Um, basically, Lola's boyfriend, Manny, does a drug deal, and he gets the money, and while he's on the subway, he forgets the bag of money, and a hobo picks it up. So, he is missing a hundred thousand dollars that he has to get to his boss uh, by noon-ish. So, Lola has 20 minutes to come up with $100,000. Um, so she goes to her father's bank. Can't get any money from her father. Uh, goes to where Manny is. They rob the store. Get the money. And then Lola gets shot by the police. And then it starts over. And then it starts over, and she goes to her father's bank again, but this time she, like, robs the bank instead. And then this time Manny gets hit by a car, and she starts all over again, and uh, that's just how the movie goes. I compared it to a video game movie. I said Ron Lola Ron is my favorite video game movie. Because it's sort of, here's your mission, here's how you can go about this mission, you gotta select the right route... And, you know, when you you get there, it's like, mission failed. Ah, oh, I gotta start over. Here we go again. Ah, oh, mission failed. Let me start over. Because <laughs> there's no explanation in the movie for why it starts over. It just does. It's a very surreal film. I'm, uh, maybe not surreal. Maybe surreal's the wrong... Eh. No, I'm gonna say it's surreal. The story is pretty straightforward, like, the stuff happening is pretty straightforward, but it has a very odd style. Like, there will be moments where it just, she's running, and then all of a sudden it's an animation of her running, and then it goes back to live action of her running, and she'll run into people, and after she runs into these people, it'll show these, like, quick flash frames of what happens to them next, and, like, how their life went after interacting with Lola in this timeline. And then she runs by the same person again the next time, and something different happens to them. And she runs by the same person the third time, and a different thing happens to them. Um, reminds me very much of Crank High Voltage. Because uh, something very similar, I mean, first off, it's just high action, like both of the Crank movies. It's just, like, going and going and going and going. There's no... There's no escalation. It's just always going. It's, it hits this high level of energy and just stays there. Although Run Lola Run does have these sort of flashback interludes to give it a little breathing room. So I appreciate that. But uh, a similar thing happens in the Crank movie, or in, in Crank High Voltage at least, where he'll like push past someone and then it'll show like some side story that character goes on. It, very heavy stylized, very weird. I do think it has a point. I wouldn't write it off as complete, like, completely style. It's not all style. Um, for as heavy as the style is in the movie. I think it does, it, there's sort of a butterfly effect thing going on with this movie. So, I appreciate that. Uh, the soundtrack is, like, all electro music. Except for, like, one moment where they play some, like, classical music. And my friend thought the movie stopped playing. Because, you know, we were watching this over, like, 
watching this over Discord, and he's like, oh, th did the movie stop? The electro music stopped. I don't know what... The Germans fucking love their electro. I don't get it. I mean, it, it does work for the movie, by and large. It's, you know, a very fast-paced movie. You need a very fast-paced soundtrack. Very high-energy soundtrack. Uh, there's a scene near the end, because she keeps running into the same ambulance. So, in her third go-around, she just hops into the back of the ambulance and meets uh, this guy who seems to recognize her. I don't think that character was in the film before that moment. Maybe. Maybe briefly in Manny's flashback, but I think that's the first we see of that character. But he seems to know Lola, and Lola acts like she knows him, so... There's a doctor there doing CPR on him, and uh, one of the friends I was watching this with is studying to be a doctor. He's in college to be a doctor, and uh, <laughs> he's like, oh, that guy's doing CPR wrong, like, because the, the, the guy he was doing CPR wrong, was on, doing CPR on was conscious while he was doing the CPR, and he wasn't doing the breaths, and he was doing it too slow, and I'm like... Harrison, a scene before this, this woman Banshee screamed at a roulette table so she could win roulette. And it worked. You're gonna fucking debate the medical science of this movie? Then we watched Zoo Warriors. I keep picking the weirdest fucking movies, man. I didn't do it on... I, I've never seen this movie before. I didn't know what this movie was about. It's so f fucking weird. Like, Rubber and Run Lola Run, weird movies, I picked those on purpose. This is some bad shit that I was not prepared for. Um, my friends and I said this was like an anime movie that came out between like season 4 and season 5. So you have to have those four seasons of context to understand who these characters are and what they're doing. And that's just absent. They're just, just these, like, magical anime power characters. Very Dragon Ball Z-esque. We did say it was better than Dragon Ball Evolution. It's a better Dragon Ball movie than Dragon Ball Evolution. They're, like, flying around and shooting lasers, and they have powers, and, like, in order to get to certain realms, their mortal bodies have to die, and... I don't understand. I don't understand what happened in this movie. It's one of those movies I simultaneously want to immediately rewatch to see if I can parse together the story... But also, I never want to watch again because it's so aggressively weird. <laughs> like, there's nothing in this. I'm never gonna get it. I'm never gonna get it. The action scenes are really good. Like, I, I don't want to make it sound like I hated this movie. It was interesting. I'm glad I watched it. Still, I'm not disappointed with any of my picks. I'm glad I watched it, but, uh... <sighs> It's fucking weird, man. It's fucking weird, and I don't get it. I... hold on. I, I went to look up a plot synopsis for this to see if it would help. Let me read you the plot synopsis on IMDb. Between the heaven and the earth exists the zoo's mountain range, where live the immortals of Ome, the highest mountain of Zoo, but the kingdom is in danger by amnesia, a renegade immortal, what want to rule Zoo and all the world. White Eyebrows, Zoo's leader, call to his most experts fighters for to defeat amnesia until destroy it, but amnesia hides in the legendary and almost myth Blood Cavern in order to make stronger his powers. While Red Eyebrow's servant watches the inter of Blood Cavern, King Sky and the other warriors will try to find a way to exterminate Amnesia with an ancient and powerful mystical swords. With, 
with an ancient with an ancient swords hoping to be free of the amnesia's threat it's about as coherent as the movie I don't know. Give it a look if you like anime. And you want to see, like, a good anime movie. Because this is, like, live-action anime. <laughs> Other than that, it's it's so fucking... What on earth is happening? Features Sammo Kembo Hung. Um, famous Chinese actor. He was in a lot of Jackie Chan's early movies. I think he was the villain... Well, one of the villains in Enter the Dragon. I'd have to look. Finally, we watched The Book of Henry. Um, so my question last week was, what's your favorite bad movie of the 2010s? And um, obviously there are movies that would top Book of Henry. Uh, Faithful Findings and Birdemic are way up there. And Cool Cat, Cool Cat obviously also way up there. But as far as like mainstream Hollywood pictures, with, like, a budget, established actors, established director. This is my favorite bad movie of the 2010s. My favorite mainstream bad movie of the 2010s. It's so fucking baffling. It's hard to explain the Book of Henry without sounding like you're kidding? So here's my best attempt. Book of Henry is the story of... Henry, a precocious 11-year-old boy genius who one day discovers that his neighbor, Glenn Sickleman, the local police commissioner, is abusing his daughter. Uh, do not remember the daughter's name. Excuse me, stepdaughter. The movie goes out of its way to point out that she is his stepdaughter. It's implied that her mother is dead, there is no mention of her biological father. I don't know where he is in all of this, but that's probably because she's a horribly underdeveloped character. Put a pin in that. So Henry discovers his neighbor, the police commissioner, is abusing his daughter. And so he calls CPS, and as it turns out, uh, the head of CPS is neighbor Glenn's brother. So he continues to get away with it. So Henry's solution is to devise a plot to murder Glenn, police commissioner. And he spends a, a good chunk of the movie plotting Glenn's murder. Halfway through the movie, Henry contracts terminal brain cancer and dies. It was the night of lead characters dying halfway through the movie. In Run, Lola, Run, she comes back because it's like a time travel thing. In Zoo Warriors, the character has to die to, like, ascend to the realm he needs to be in. In Book of Henry, Henry just dies. So he leaves incredibly detailed instructions for his mother to carry out the murder. And his mother, Susan, carries out Henry, her 11-year-old child's, plan to murder the neighbor up to the very last step. She has Glenn in her sights and goes... I dropped my phone. She has Glenn in her sights and then sees a picture, some, like, childhood photos of Henry and is like, wait a minute, Henry's 11? Maybe it's best not to murder the police commissioner at the behest of my dead 11-year-old son. And then she runs into Glenn on the, her way back to the house. She tells Glenn, oh, Henry recorded everything. You're going to be in so much trouble. And uh, about that time, the principal of the school determines that uh, his stepdaughter is definitely being abused. And she calls CPS. Um... So Glenn, seeing no way out, kills himself. Meaning all of Henry's planning was for naught. Gotta love it. 
This is one of my favorite bad movies of the 2010s, but I could not do an episode of Matt's Funtime Bad Movie Show of it. I do want to make clear, there can be crossover between Matt Presents and Matt's Funtime Bad Movie Show. One of the movies I'm showing this week, I already talked about on Matt's Funtime Bad Movie Show, and I definitely plan on showing films at Matt Pres- in, in, at my movie nights, and then later talking about them on Matt's Funtime Bad Movie Show. So be aware of that. But this is not a movie that I could do on Matt's Funtime Bad Movie Show. It's just a little too slow, first off, and the problems are too deeply rooted. It would require, like, deep-dive, genuine analysis, which is not really my format. Now, I could do a video essay on it. I do video essays from time to time. So I could do an analysis of this movie, but one of those already exists. Um, one of my favorite YouTube channels is Folding Ideas, and my absolute favorite video from Folding Ideas is his breakdown of everything wrong with Book of Henry and how it just fails on so many levels. I will put a link to that. The cards are on this side. I need to put like a sticky note on the wall because I keep pointing over here because my screen is flipped. It's here. Here is where the, the, the cards are. There's Folding Ideas video. Highly recommended by me. Um... So I'm going to try to talk about Book of Henry without covering the same details he does. I'll probably say a few things here and there that are in that video. But firstly and foremostly, foremostly, I want to talk about Henry. The movie spends so much time telling us like Henry is this smart, brilliant kid who thinks of everything. He's just the greatest. But he's wrong. He is wrong about so many things. And I don't just mean I disagree with him. Because there are scenes where he's like... Like he tells his teacher it's better for him to stay... If, better for him to not be in advanced classes. Because it's better for his psychosocial development. I disagree, but I'm bringing external real world logic into the film. By the film's own logic, Henry is wrong. Constantly. He tells his mother to do a bunch of things, and she does none of them. And I, I don't just mean the killing Glenn part. She doesn't kill Glenn. That's number one. That's the big thing. And the movie does go out of its way to say he's wrong about that. But he also criticizes his mother for playing video games too much, for getting drunk exactly once and for working a job she doesn't need. I'll kind of give him credit on that one. She doesn't need to work the job, and at the end it's kind of implied she is not working the job anymore, although not really directly stated, so maybe she is, it's just implied she is not. But it's not like her work ever gets in the way of her being a real par of, of being a good parent. She is a single mother raising two boys, and working a job just fine. She's never playing video games instead of being a parent. She doesn't get drunk to the point where she can't function. And in fact, Henry doesn't even criticize her for getting drunk. He criticizes her for enabling her friend's alcoholism, which is not true. Here's the thing. Uh, Susan doesn't listen to him. Of those three things, playing video games, working a job she doesn't need, getting drunk, she doesn't listen to him. Maybe, maybe she quits her job, but she could still be working it and she'd be fine. She doesn't do the three things he says and she's fine. Everything turns out fine without her taking Henry's advice. So by the film's own logic, Henry is wrong. There are a bunch of side characters in this movie that do nothing. There's Susan's friend Sheila, played by Sarah Silverman, of all people. Um, she has this, like, antagonistic banter with Henry, but it doesn't go anywhere. And uh, she and Henry's mom 
are like, ooh, irresponsible, but not really. They're still perfectly responsible adults. There's an implied... <laughs> Again, this is totally subtext, but there's like a subtextual implication of a romantic relationship between... Actually, this is... Uh, I was gonna say between Sheila and Susan, but there's also, in the last in moments of Henry's life, Kind of an implied one between Sheila and Henry. That makes me uncomfortable. Um, makes me a lot more comfortable to assume there's one between her and his mom. His mom cuffs her jeans. I'm not saying she's bisexual, but I am heavily implying it. Uh, then there is, in the immortal words of Fateful Findings, the doctor at the hospital, who, after Henry dies, shows up, at Susan's house to, like, comfort her and his little brother Peter. And there's no reason for him to have shown up at the house other than to, like, kind of flirt with Susan. And then he shows up at, like, uh, Peter's talent show. Peter, Henry's younger brother, shows up at Peter's talent show because Henry invited him. Um... And it's sort of, again, there's like the subtextual, oh, he's gonna be, he's a potential love interest, which that was probably intentional, uh, intentional, an intentional, he's supposed to be the love interest, but, uh, he never makes a move and disappears from the film. He's, he's not mentioned in the wrap up. There's not a moment, like, like if he had just like said to Susan, like, Hey, let's get coffee sometime. And the movie left it at that. Well, okay, I'll take, I'll assume the two of them start dating. But he doesn't even do that. He, he just, he tells Peter, oh, good job. And then leaves. So, why was he in this movie? I mean, I guess a doctor had to be in the movie, but he didn't have to show up after Henry died. Uh, and then there's the neighbor girl, whose name I still cannot remember. Let's see if it's on the back of the box. Nope, nope, it literally just calls her the girl next door. The back of the box doesn't even remember the girl's name. She does nothing in this movie. Like, she is there for the plot convenience of... Henry needs a reason to want to murder Glenn. Glenn is abusing a girl his age. Ipso facto, Henry wants to kill Glenn. Uh, this girl could be a puppy. If Glenn was just, like, kicking his puppy, and Henry went, well, I'm gonna kill Glenn and rescue the puppy, the plot would be exactly the same. Like, d this did not have to be a human person. God, what else? So... I was watching Cats earlier this week. Finally came to Redbox, so I, I, I watched Cats. I feel like there was this period where mainstream Hollywood movies... Where, like, like, mainstream Hollywood, when they made bad movies, they weren't funny bad, they were just insufferably bad. It's like, like, early 2000s through, like, mid-2010s. There were no funny bad movies. No funny bad mainstream Hollywood bad movies, which there have been in every decade prior. And I feel like in the late 2010s, we started getting this new type of so bad it's good movie, of hilariously bad movie, uh, and Book of Henry is king among them. Um, although Katz is challenging that throne hard. Just the absolute bafflement bad movies. The movies that go, how? How did a studio look at this and say, yes, this is acceptable? Like, when it's an indie film and it's mostly down to, like, one guy doing all this crazy shit? Okay, that makes sense. How does Hollywood keep letting this shit happen? Because there's this, there's Serenity, there's uh, Cats, there's Disney's Wrinkle in Time. 
all hilarious movies. I would recommend all four of those movies. If you're looking for bad movies, Book of Henry, uh, Serenity, not the Firefly movie. The Firefly movie's pretty good, but I mean the Matthew McConaughey movie. Cats and uh, Disney's Wrinkle in Time. Hilarious, all four of them. Then to be fair, studios tried to not release this one. This was written in the 90s, and it has sat on a shelf. It sat on a shelf for 18 years before it got produced. And it reeks of a film that is overwritten. A, a, a film that has just sat around too long. The writer keeps going back and making changes. So there's an idea of this film. Boy Genius sets out to murder his neighbor. And everything else exists to support that. So then it becomes, okay, why does he want to murder his neighbor? Well, his neighbor's abusing a little girl. Well, why can't he just call CPS? Well, the neighbor's brother is the head of CPS. Okay, how's he going to kill the neighbor? Well, he just shoots him in the head. Okay, uh, how's a kid going to get a gun? Oh shit, uh, actually he dies and his mother buys the gun for him and... Like, I almost wonder if there wasn't an early draft of this script where Henry lives, and that was just a plot contrivance so that Susan has to carry out the plans and not Henry. I don't know. I can't say either way. This is also part of the reason J.J. Abrams was allowed to ruin Star Wars. Because uh, Colin Trevorrow... Yeah, Colin Trevorrow was scheduled to direct Star Wars Episode Nine, And then Book of Henry was a colossal financial and critical failure. Um, critical failure, obviously. Financial failure, I'm disappointed. This is a good movie. People should watch this. I mean, it's not a good movie. It's a bad movie. But people should watch this. Um... I mean, I bought the Blu-ray. So, after that, Colin Trevorrow was suddenly not directing Episode 9. Suddenly, J.J. Abrams was directing Episode 9 again. Um, and so the, the speculation is Book of Henry is what ruined it for Colin Trevorrow. I can't even say that's unfortunate. I mean, I don't like what J.J. Abrams did with Episode Nine, but Colin Trevorrow is a bad director. Colin Trevorrow is a bad director. <laughs> oh. Fucking insanity. Oh. I forgot to mention my favorite scene in this movie. My favorite scene in this movie is... So, uh, uh, one night, Henry sees Glynn abusing his stepdaughter... The next day at school, she's sad, and she won't eat a donut, and after she refuses the donut, Henry gets up, storms out of his classroom in the middle of class, goes to the principal's office, bursts in like he's a fucking cop, and yells, Damn it, Janet, how long does this have to go on? It's like, Henry, you found out about this... Less than 24 hours ago. What the fuck are you talking about? And they have this whole scene that it's, it's like something from a cop movie. Where like a cop would argue with his boss like, Oh, damn it, someone's being hurt out there and all you care about is following the rules. And the, the principal's like, well, he's the police commissioner, and I don't want to expose him to public scrutiny without significant evidence. And it ends with Henry just yelling, Fine, I'll do it on my own! And storms out like a fucking loose cannon cop. It's glorious. It's so wonderful. I love this movie. <laughs> I guess the question for this week is... What's your favorite movie... That's been reviewed on Matt's Funtime Bad Movie Show. Because it uh, can be either a movie you genuinely like, 
that has been featured on Matt's Funtime Bad Movie Show, or you think it's not bad, or your favorite bad movie I've t- spoken about. Um, I guess you all know mine, but I'll talk about it next week. So first up this week is the 1984... Can you guys hear that? Can you hear the guy fucking mowing right outside my fucking apartment? So up first this week is House, the 1984 comedy horror film. Uh, not the Japanese horror movie, the American one. House. Uh, I have the name, the year, the director all at the bottom. And then we're gonna watch Shark Attack 3 Megalodon, which I don't have a box for. And then... Because one of my friends wanted to watch it. We're going to watch Fly and Ryan. Uh, one of the earliest films I reviewed. Um, not a very good review. Uh, the audio quality is fucking terrible. And I am very uncomfortable talking on camera. So uh, we'll be talking about those three in one week instead of two. And until next time, I'm Matt. And have a nice day.